No other book has so profoundly impacted so many lives as the Bible. Welcome to Simply the Bible, the Through the Bible teaching program of Pastor Daryl Zachman of Calvary Chapel, Treasure Valley. Today, Pastor Daryl addresses what is the most controversial part of Genesis and the origin of the Giants. Not the baseball team, but the mighty men of renown in biblical history. We pick it up in Genesis chapter 6. Hope you'll join us for Simply the Bible. Can one person really make a difference? Sometimes we feel so insignificant in such a big, big world. But today we will see how one person really did make a difference for all of us. We pick it up in Genesis chapter 6. Now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. The planet was exploding in population for several reasons. First, there was no known birth control, so children were being born as frequently as humanly possible. Second, parents were having children as late as 500 years old. Theoretically, one mother could give birth to 500 children. I imagine that by the second or third century, when she saw a certain twinkle in her husband's eye, she ran as fast as she could in the opposite direction. Third, the average life expectancy was about 900 years. So lots of people were being added and very few subtracted. Conservatively, there could have been several billion people on the earth at the time of the flood. Verse 3, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. With increased population came increased wickedness. We see how this is often the case today in high-density urban centers. Alcoholism, drug abuse, violence, and sexual perversion are plagues in our inner cities. This is a very revealing verse. First, we see the active role of the Holy Spirit. Not only was he hovering over the waters when the earth was formless and void, but he was also hovering over hearts, convicting them in their conscience of evil deeds and influencing them toward good deeds. However, God's Spirit would not always strive with man in that he was flesh. Man had inherited a corrupt, sinful nature from Adam that often degenerated from bad to worse. Therefore, God set a time limit of 120 years. Did this mean 120 years before the flood? Some think so. Or was God changing man's lifespan? Personally, I think it was the latter. I believe a sovereign act of God best accounts for the average lifespan so drastically changing after the flood and then quickly leveling off. So that by the time we get to the end of Genesis, Joseph died at 110 years. And Moses was exactly 120 years old when he died. For the one who created everything by his spoken word, it would have been a snap for him to change our DNA. Now, we come to probably the most controversial part of Genesis. Let's read verse 2 again along with verse 4 to get the full picture. The sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. Verse 4, there were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterward when the sons of God came in to the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. This brings up three questions. Who were the sons of God? Who were the daughters of men? Who were the giants, the Hebrew is Nephilim, and the mighty men of old? There are two camps of interpretation. The first is that the sons of God were descendants of Seth, and the daughters of men were from Cain's family. They say that giants is not the best translation of the Hebrew word Nephilim, which appears only one other time in Scripture, in Numbers 13.33. There it says, We saw the giants, the descendants of Anak, 
come from the giants. And we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. They also say that there was intermarriage, the godly men of Seth with the ungodly women of Cain. Their offspring were mighty men of old and evil, but probably not giants. The problem with this interpretation is that in other places in Scripture, the phrase sons of God always refers to angelic beings. In Job 1.6, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. Then the Lord questions Job in chapter 38, saying, Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Making the sons of God the descendants of Seth is quite a stretch from these verses. The second problem is that the word Nephilim seems to denote a different race. And giants is probably a good translation because in Numbers 13.33, the Hebrews were like grasshoppers compared to them. How do mixed marriages of godly sons and ungodly daughters result in a race of giants and mighty men of old? The second interpretation is that the sons of God were angels, as found in other places in Scripture, or more specifically, fallen angels. They saw the beautiful daughters of men, took them for themselves, and bore children to them. This is the traditional interpretation going back to the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament written in 250 BC. It's also supported by early church fathers. It seems to offer a better explanation of how a race of superhumans would originate. However, it's not without its problems. Namely, how do angels procreate? Jesus implied in Luke 20 that angels neither marry nor are given in marriage. However, he didn't say that they were sexless. Another possibility is that demons took possession of men who raped women and had children by them. However, this still doesn't explain how a race of giants and mighty men of old would originate. In conclusion, this is one of many areas in Scripture where it is probably best to admit that we don't know for sure. But one thing that seems certain from the context, whether there were mixed human marriages, angelic human marriages or demonized rapes, sexual perversion was rampant. Verse 5. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of men was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. When it comes to understanding the ways of God, we must watch ourselves lest we foolishly rush in where angels fear to tread. God's ways are not our ways, and his thoughts are not our thoughts. We can relate to God in part, but his mind is as far above ours as the heavens are above the earth. Sometimes, I wish people would remember that before they get so dogmatic about questionable things. How can God know everything, including the future, and be sorry that he made man? Didn't he already know what man would do before he made him? Certainly. But that didn't prevent God from grieving in his heart. Even though the Holy Spirit knows what we will do, we can still grieve him. I believe that What we see here is the pain any parent feels when they must discipline their child times at least a billion. Man was the masterpiece of God's creation, but now his wickedness had reached a critical level where God had to intervene. We understand from the movies how a person that has committed a heinous crime must be brought to justice. But would we deny God his rightful place as judge? Surely the Creator has mastery over His creation and can create and destroy as He chooses. The Godhead who deliberated in the creation of man certainly must have deliberated in His destruction. This was no easy task for the one who takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. 
Satan delights to slander the Almighty by painting him in terms of a ruthless dictator who heartlessly snuffs out people who offend him. Nothing could be further from the truth. He exercises judgment against evil or else he would not be the judge. But it is his strange duty to harm objects of his love whom he desires to save. Verse 8, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God, and Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. This is the first time in Scripture we find the word grace. In Bible interpretation, there is the rule of first mention, which states that however a word first appears establishes its fundamental meaning. Now we understand grace as meaning unmerited favor, but look at how it is first used. Great wickedness is so prevalent that God must bring judgment. Nevertheless, there's one person who finds grace with God and thereby is saved from the impending doom. Likewise, we are fallen creatures with a sinful nature, living in a wicked world. Everything cries out for judgment, yet because we have believed in Jesus Christ, we have found grace in the eyes of the Lord and have been saved from the impending doom. We are considered just, not because we have lived perfect lives, but because we have been justified by faith. Now, because we are saved and delivered from our sins, the Holy Spirit helps us to walk with God and to please Him. Because Noah found grace with God, not only was he able to save himself, but also the entire world. One person really can make a difference. Verse 11, The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. For the antediluvian world that would soon be destroyed, this was the tragic epitaph on its tombstone. Jesus told us in Matthew 24, But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. Watch, therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. May God help us find grace in His sight by believing in Jesus Christ and walking with him. May God help us be watchful in this wicked world so that we are ready to escape the judgment that is to come and to stand justified before Almighty God. You've been listening to Simply the Bible, the Through the Bible teaching program of Pastor Daryl Zachman of Calvary Chapel, Treasure Valley. They meet Sunday mornings at 1030 at Pepperidge Elementary School in Boise. To listen to any of Pastor Darrell's teachings or to find out more about the church, go to their website at calvarytv.org. That's calvarytv.org. Join Pastor Darrell tomorrow to explore God's plan to Noah to build the ark as he continues in the book of Genesis on Simply the Bible. <laughs>